Dominus vobiscum. Oremus. Deus qui ecclesiam tuam annua quadragesimale observatione purificas. Presta familiae tuae, ut coda te abtinere abstinendo nititur, hoc bonis operibus exequatur, per Dominum nostrum Iesum Christum finium tuum, qui tecum vivere regnate in unitate Spiritus Sancti Deus, per omnia secula seculorum. Lexio Epistolae Viati Pauli Apostoli Ad Corinthios. Fratres, exhortamur vos ne in vacuum gratiam de recipiatis. Aed enim tempore accepto exaudi di te, ed in die salutus ad iubite. Ece nunc tempus acetabile, ece nunc die salutis. Ne minitante sullam offensionem, ut non vituperetur ministerium nostrum. Sed in omnibus exibiamus nos metipso sicut dei ministros, in multa pazientia, in tribulationibus, in necessitatibus, in augustis, in plagis, in caceribus, in sedizionibus, in laboribus, in vigilis, in iunis, in castitate, in scientia, in organimitate, in suavitate, in spiritu santo, in caritate non ficta, in verbo veritatis, in virtute dei, per alma, justizia et extis, ed a sinistris. Per gloriam et ignobilitatem, per infamiam et bonam famam, ut seductores e veraces, sicut qui ignoti et coniti, quasi morientes e recivivimus, u castigati e non motificati, quasi tristes sempre autem gaudentes, Sicur e gentes, multus autem loco pletantes, tam quam nicel habitantes on omnia posidentes. Angelis suis Dios a la vez.
Dominus Fabiscum, Sequencia Sancti Evangelii Secundum Matteo. In illo tempore, ductus est Jesus in desertum espiritu, et tentaretur a diabolo. Ecum iunas et quadriginta diebus, et quadriginta noctibus, postia esurit. Et accendens tentator dixi dei, si filius deus et deies, dicut lapides iste panes fiant. Qui respondens dixit, scriptum est, non in solo pane vivit homo, sed in omni verbo, quod procedet de ore dei. Tum garsum sit eum, diabolus in sanctam civitatem, et statuet eum super pinaculum templi, et dixit dei, si filius dei est, mite te de orsum. Scriptum est enum, quia angelus suis mandavit de te, et in manibus tolent te, de forte offendas ad lapidem pedem tu. Aet ili Iesus, rursum scriptus est, non titabus dominum deum tu. Iturum asum sideum diabolus in montem excelsum valde, et ostendi Dei omnia regna dum mundi, et gloria meiorum et dixi Dei. Hec omnia tibi davo, si cadens adoraveris me. Tuc dici Dei Iesus, vade Satana, scriptum est enim, dominum Deum tuum adorabis, et ele soli servies. Tum grele quit eum diavolo serece angeli accesserum, et ministra amant ei. The epistle is from the second letter to the Corinthians. Brethren, we beg you, as your fellow workers, not to receive the favor of God in vain. For he says, in a favorable time, I heard you, and on a day of salvation, I helped you. Now is the favorable time. Now is the day of salvation. We avoid giving anyone occasion for taking offense, 
at anything in order that the ministry may not be blamed. On the contrary, in everything we strive to show ourselves as ministers of God, with great fortitude in trial, distress, difficulties, in beatings, imprisonment, riots, with hard work, sleepless nights, and fasting, with innocence, knowledge, patience, and kindness, with a Holy Spirit, with sincere love, with the message of truth and the power of God, wielding the weapons of justice with right hand and left, whether honored or dishonored, whether spoken of well or ill. We are called, we are called impostors, yet we are truthful, nobodies, and yet we are well known, dead, and here we are, alive, punished, and we have not yet been put to death. Sorrowful, and we are always rejoicing, poor, and we are enriching many. We are said to have nothing, and yet we possess everything. The Gospel is from St. Matthew. At that time, Jesus was led into the desert by the Spirit to be tempted by the devil. He fasted 40 days and 40 nights, and afterward he was hungry. Then the tempter approached him and said to him, If you are God's son, command these stones to turn into bread. But he replied, Scripture has it, not on bread alone is man to live, but on every command that issues from the mouth of God. Next the devil took him to the holy city. He set him upon the highest point in the temple, saying, If you are God's son, throw yourself down. Scripture has it, he will bid his angels to look after you. With their hands they will support you, that you may never even stumble over a stone. Jesus answered him, Scripture also has it, you shall not make trial of the Lord your God. Again, the devil took him along to a lofty mountain peak and displayed before him all the kingdoms of the world and their magnificence, promising, all this will I bestow upon you if you prostrate yourself in homage before me. Then Jesus said to him, away with you, Satan. Scripture has it, you shall do homage to the Lord your God. Him alone shall you adore. At that, the devil left him. And at once, angels came and waited on him. The Mass intentions for this Mass is for Father Ben Kinkle. Have you ever been tempted to run from God? Have I ever been tempted to run from God or to try to hide from God? I think if I'm honest, I can admit I think, yes, I don't just think I know. There have been times in my life when I've run from God or tried to hide from Him. And I think it's probably true of you too. Because if we get too close to God or we allow Him to enter into our hearts, he will demand that we are willing, anyway, to be changed. He will affect the change, but we have to be willing to be changed. And sometimes, a lot of times, I'm uncomfortable with change. I get into a rut and don't want to change. Too comfortable with my old ways of doing things. And yet, my old ways of doing things can, can lead to, to big problems. Because sin snowballs. It's like a snowball effect, rolling down a hill, a snowball becomes bigger and bigger, and sin can come, come bigger and bigger and larger and larger, more and more looming, 
unless we admit it and recognize it, quit hiding from God, quit running from God, and admit we were wrong, that we have sinned, and that we need his healing and his forgiveness and his mercy. One of the most iconic images of running from God is the photo taken of Pope John Paul II, St. John Paul II, when he visited his would-be assassin, Ali Aja, in the prison in Rome. It was within a year or so, I believe, that Pope John Paul visited his assassin. He went intentionally, John Paul did, in order to extend a word of forgiveness to the person who attempted to murder him. The picture is very moving. You see how John Paul is leaning toward Ali Aja. Ali Aja has his eyes glued to John Paul II, but only a few people overheard the conversation, and his secretary uh, overheard what went on between John Paul and Ali Aja. Pope John Paul uh, lets Ali Aja know that he was forgiving him, offering him forgiveness for what he had attempted to do, murder him. But what was stunning was that Ali Aja could only keep repeating how the words of surprise. He kept repeating the fact that he was surprised that John Paul survived the three bullets that he had pumped into his body. John Paul extended a hand of mercy and forgiveness, and from Ali Aja there was no sign of sorrow, no apologies, no contrition, running from God. This is everyone's temptation, and on the first Sunday of Lent we hear the story of Christ himself being tempted, and to every temptation Christ emphatically says, no. To the temptation facing all of us of running away from God, of avoiding admitting our wrongs, our sins, of saying we are sorry before a merciful God, we need to say before that temptation an unambiguous and resounding no. No. I will not deny my sin, my wrongdoing, my offenses, my shortcomings, my foibles, my flaws, my failures. I will not deny them. I will admit them before the throne of a merciful God who loves us all that much and who assures us no, that no matter how great the sin is, his mercy is greater still. You see, the devil tries to convince us that God cannot forgive. Oftentimes they'll say, hey, sin's too great. You're too great a sinner. God can't forgive even you. So deny your sin and run from God. Or he'll try to convince us, the devil will, that it's not sin at all. Oh, it's just being human. Everybody's doing it. Society says it's okay, so it must be okay. The media says it's okay, it must be okay. The devil and his wiles and his temptations. To those, we must answer with an emphatic no. Lend us a time to renew our faith in the power of God's mercy and forgiveness in our life, to embrace Christ, but not to embrace just part of what Christ offers us, but to embrace everything about Christ, all that he offers us. For he is the way and he offers us the pathway to eternal glory. He is the truth. And he breaks through the falsehoods and the errors and the deceits and the lies of this world. He is the truth. And he wants us to embrace the truth. He wants us to embrace him. He's the way, the truth, and the life, and he offers us, especially at every Mass, in Holy Communion, in the Eucharist, in the power of his presence, he offers his life to us so that he may fill us with his presence and overcome the power of deceit and denial, which leads us to run from God and to try to hide from him. God wants us to surrender our lives to him and to admit that oftentimes we echo the words of a song that was quite popular some years ago by Frank Sinatra. I had it my way. 
Now, I, I kind of like Frank Sinatra. It's great music. But rubbish, poison when it comes to religion. I had it my way. Do we think for a moment we're going to stand before the face of a God who loves us that much and who did that much for us and for our forgiveness? For us not to admit that we are sins, but to say, I had it my way. I think Christ weeps a lot. I really do sometimes. I think Christ looks at us sometimes and he weeps when we deny how much we need his mercy and his forgiveness one day at a time. I don't want it my way because my way can lead me on a slippery slope downward. His way is the way to eternal life and he is the only way, the only truth, and the only life. For far too many, the temptation comes that we can live a mediocre life, a mediocre faith, a lukewarm faith. We can pick and choose the, the things we believe in, the things we discard. How important is the faith to us? Well, how important is the Catholic faith to you? Faith in Christ and everything he offers us. How important is that really to us when we look at our week? How much of my heart was given to Christ this week? How much of my mind, how much of my time, how much of my talents, how much of my treasure was given to God in service to him? Was he the center of my life or was I the center of my life? I wanted my way. There was a study, a poll that came out just two days ago. Polls aren't infallible, but they usually are accurate to some extent. And this, another poll on the Catholic faith and its observance in the United States, I think is, is quite revealing. Probably doesn't come as much as a surprise, but... In this recent poll, the question was, how important is the Catholic faith to you? This was a course given to Catholics. Of the people polled, how many, what percent do you think said Catholic faith to me is very important? Think in your in mind, come up with a number. Recent poll, how important is the Catholic faith to you? Is the Catholic faith very important? 51% said it's very important. 51% of American Catholics said the Catholic faith is very important. Bravo for the 51. 49% of Catholics said, cum si cum sa. Fairly important, somewhat important, occasionally important. When I'm desperate, it's important. When I need God, it's important. When I have nobody else to help or nowhere else to go, it's important. But the rest of the time, I want it my way. And where does that get us? 51% believe the faith is very important. I find that absolutely appalling, disgusting, reprehensible. What is happening to us? Now you might say, what are you talking to me for? Because you know what? To some extent, to some extent, we're all part of the, the rot. When we're all part of the rot that's set in, when we fail to admit how much we need God in our lives each day, how much we must place him at the center of our lives. We're all part of the rot that we really don't think the faith is important when we say to him, I want it my way. The next question asked in this poll was, how many of you believe in all the teachings of the Catholic Church? You're Catholic. How many of you believe all the teachings that the Church proposes? Think of a number. How many, what percent do you think said, I believe in all the teachings of Christ Church, American Catholics? How many of you think, Mike? Deacon Mike? 18%. Eighteen percent believe in all the teachings of Christ Church. And no one is 
saying that it's easy to embrace all the teachings of Christ in His church and the Scripture and in the teachings, the solemn teachings of the church. He never said it was easy. He never said it was a rose garden. He never said it would be easy. He said it would be a cross. But He didn't give us an option. He didn't present to us cafeteria Catholicism. Like I remember I used to go to Bishop's Cafeteria and I used to pick and choose. And, and my mother would pick for me and she'd give me broccoli. And I'd turn back the broccoli and I'd pick chocolate pudding. She slapped my hands and put the pudding back and gave me back the broccoli. Cafeteria Catholicism. I pick only what I like, what satisfies my sweet tooth, spiritually speaking. The rest I'll leave. Christ calls us, even though it's difficult, to come before him with a humble heart and say, you know, Lord, I find a lot of things in, in, the, in the faith very difficult to embrace and to live by, but I know how much I need you in order to be faithful. And so I ask you, make me faithful. Help me to embrace even those things I do not understand, because if you say they are so, they must be so. I want it your way. I don't come before you and teach you. I come before you and ask that you might teach me. Because you are the way, the truth, and the life, and in you alone is their salvation. In you alone is their freedom, true freedom. In you alone is their true peace. In you alone is eternal life. This Lent is a time for us to recognize that we need to examine our hearts to see if we've been singing that tune, wanted it my way. Adam and Eve sang the tune, wanted it my way, and look what that's gotten us. Thanks, Adam and Eve. The original sin, the original rebellion. We're flawed, we're weak. We need God's grace to be faithful. And Lent is a time to wake up, yes. I've been singing that tune to the great an extent. I want it my way in terms of what I believe and don't believe, Catholicism, cafeteria style, or faith in God when it serves my purposes. The rest of the time I march in lockstep with everyone else, even though everyone else might be going the wrong direction. Fools. And the Lord weeps. Someone gave me a story the other day about an example of rebellion and where it gets us. It is a story of a sheep in New Zealand whose name was Shrek. And this happened a couple years ago. This shepherd, he used to shear, you know, he'd cut the fleece, cut the wool. But there was one of his sheep called Shrek who obviously didn't want to be shorn of his wool and so he ran. And he left the rest of the pack and he left his shepherd. And for six years, Shrek the sheep hid from his shepherd. Six years. And during those six years, his wool grew to causing him to weigh the sheep 60 pounds. The wool itself, 60 pounds. 60 pounds of wool in a little sheep. Normally it's 9 to 15 pounds at most. <laughs> And so he was found, Shrek was, and he was brought and they took care of his fleece. And he was freed of the excess bondage, baggage that weighed him down and could have killed him. Experts say that if he had continued that way, he would have suffocated from the weight and the heat. And so he was saved. When he came to recognize, I don't know if sheep recognize anything, but he came to understand that he had to be freed of that excess baggage. When he ran from his shepherd, he needed to return and be freed. And that's what Lent is all about, to, to understand that we're like Shrek the sheep sometimes. We want to carry along our excess baggage, our excess weight. We run from the shepherd. We run and hide. I don't want to change. It's too uncomfortable. Oh, it's just a habit. Everybody's doing it. It's just being modern. After all, this is 2020. No. Lord, I don't want it my way. 
because my way leads me down the slippery slope to hell because you alone are the pathway to salvation and you've given us the church the truth which is the road map to eternity Christ didn't leave us here on earth without a road map he said here's a road map here follow this road map and you'll get to heaven the road map teaches us shows us inspires us empowers us the church the grace of God on how to navigate the twists and turns of this life to avoid the detours that lead us to, to, to hell, but to follow the pathway that the road map shows us to heaven. Some of us want to avoid the road map and toss it aside. Oh, I'll make it on my own or change the road map. And we'll only find out we're lost and we're doomed if we don't follow the road map and we'll never get to our destination, which of course is paradise, heaven. I've been thinking a lot about the, sh the veil of Veronica, the Shroud of Turin, been meditating a lot upon it, re doing a lot of reading on the image of the face of Jesus on the Shroud of Turin and on Veronica's veil. <sighs> the power in the image, the face of Jesus, the bleeding face, the divine face of Jesus. And, of course, before the statue of the Sacred Heart, below it, there's the image, copy of Veronica's veil. Veronica wiped the face of Jesus and left an imprint on it. My prayer throughout Lent, focusing on that and asking, Lord, imprint the image of your face upon my soul. Because your image, your presence within me will guide me and inspire me to sing your song, to have it your way, not my way. I want my image on your soul so that when you look into my heart you'll not see darkness but light so that with your image on my heart and on my soul your divine grace I will be inspired to follow the road map that you have given us in the church and through the church not putting myself in a position to decide what's true and what's false to put back on the cafeteria shelf those teachings that may make me uncomfortable or be somewhat bitter, but to know that what is good for me is given to me, and even though I may not like it, I want it his way. And so I offer before the image of the veil of Veronica a short prayer that you can echo in your hearts as we begin Lent together. O oh Lord Jesus, imprint the image of your face upon my heart. Imprint the image of your face upon my life. May I always put you first. And when I run or wander from you, may I always remember you allow U-turns in this life that even though I've wanted it my way, I can turn around and receive your mercy and confess, I want it your way. Let me return, Lord, with all my heart to you this Lent. Amen. Credo in unum Deum. Amen. Amen.
Dominus Vobiscum. Oremus. Scapulis Suis. Eromnia secula seculorum. Dominus vobiscum. Sursum corda. Grazia sagamus domino Deo nostro.
Der ein in jume et justum est, ecum et salutare, nos tibi semper in ubique gratias agere. Domine Sancte Pater Omnipotens Eterne Deus, qui corporalie unio vitia comprimis, mente me levas, virtutem la giris et premia, per Christum Dominum nostrum. Per quem maestatem tuam laudant angeli, Adoran dominationes, tremun potestates. Celi celorum que virtutes, ac beata serafim. Socia exultatione concelebrant. Cum quibus et nostras voces, ur admiti iubias de precamur, suplici confessione dicentes. Sanctus, 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 Sanctus,
Peromnia secula seculorum. Oremus, precepti salutaribus moniti, et divina institutione formati, audemus dicere, Pater noster qui es in celis, Sanctifice tur nomen tu, adveni a regnum tu, fiat voluntas tua, sicur in cielo et in terra. Panem nostrum quotidianum da nobis horie, et dimite nobis debita nostra, sicur et nos dimitimus debitoribus nostris, et ne nos inducas in tentationem. Per omnia secula seculorum. Amen. Ax domini sit semper vobiscum.
Dominus vobiscum. Oremus. Tuis nos domine sacramenti, libatio sancte restaure. Era vetus tate purgatos, in misteri salutaris facit transige, transire consortium. Per dominum nostrum Iesum Christum fidium tuum, qui tecum vivit et regnat, in unitate spiritus sancti Deus, per omnia secula seculorum. Dominus vobiscum, ite misa Benedicat vos omnipotens Deus, Pater et Filius et Spiritus Sanctus, Dominus Ubiscum. Missus Sancti Evangelii Secundi Ioannem. Today's announcements. First Friday is this Friday. There'll be an additional Mass at 7 p.m. in the evening. At 6 o'clock, we pray the Stations of the Cross and Benediction. And once again, I, I want to challenge you. I want to challenge you to come to Stations of the Cross at least once during Lent. Because it's a powerful, sta it's a powerful statement about your faith. When we are here and we have a lot of people here, there's, there's encouragement in that, that we're all together and walking the way of the cross. Oh, I can do it at home in my closet. You can stay home and pray too, but you come to Mass. Is there's, there's a power and anointing and being together, particularly in the presence of the Blessed Sacrament. So I want to encourage you to come at least once. Come as often as you can on Fridays of Lent. There's a fish fry from 5 to 7. You can come to that too. The stations begin at 5, and uh, benediction follows. We're offering a prayer book, Stations of the Cross booklet uh, for Lent, uh, where you can also say the stations at home. They're in that basket right there on the organ and also in the back of church. We're collecting items for the Catholic Worker House. More details in your bulletin. Parish mission begins next Sunday. And the rest of the announcements are in the bulletin. God bless you all.
Saint Michael, the Archangel. And so Most sacred heart of Jesus. Most sacred heart of Jesus. Most sacred heart of Jesus. The Immaculate Heart of Mary. Saint Joseph. Saint Anthony. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. I think there's a potluck tonight, isn't there? So if you'd like to come down and join in the potluck, that'd be wonderful.